Well, Lee Badman, if you don't know him, he is a wireless network architect uh, and a higher education institution here in the U.S. He is CWNE number 200, and he is probably my favorite blogger in the Wi-Fi community. He's entertaining. Uh, he is cantankerous. <laughs> and he will, uh, he, he, he calls them like he sees them, uh, which is uh, a great quality to have. You can follow his blog at wirednot.wordpress.com. Uh, he, he writes in some other places uh, like network computing and IT toolbox. And uh, he's on Twitter at wirednot. So Lee, uh, with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to you if you're ready. I am. Thanks, Jim. Can't tanker us. What are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, what I have to share today is we're going to talk about common wireless performance and reputation killers. We kind of differentiate them a little bit. Um, there's a lot here, obviously, to talk about under these headings. Uh, I could go for hours. Um, we don't have hours, so hopefully we do hit some thought-provoking high points today in the time that we do have. The reason I break these down kind of between performance and reputation, obviously there's going to be overlap. Um, they kind of bleed into each other. But under the topic of performance, as you guys well know, um, you know, we're kind of living in the technical world. When it comes to you know personal and organ organizational reputation, as far as supporting Wi-Fi, it kind of gets beyond the technical and gets you into you know everything from management to uh, just the human side of wireless. So hopefully the nuance comes through as we talk. Uh, just a little bit more about me. Uh, we don't have to stay on this very long, but you know I try to stay busy. I've been around a while. I've been uh, fortunate to have a lot of opportunities in a lot of uh, different directions and always happy to talk with anybody with common interests anytime. So by all means, um, hit me up, don't be a stranger. Try to be active in the community, et cetera. And with that, let's uh, dig in. So I'm gonna start us with the um, performance killers. And I don't have a lot of slides, um, but we'll talk about each one of these. So we'll be uh, dwelling on the slide a little bit. Um, poor design to me kind of sets us up for failure. Um, if you can get your designs right, a lot of uh, the other things we'll talk about hopefully don't show up very often. Um, good design is the foundation of everything that comes after. That's just not on wireless, that's on, you know, LAN and WAN and a lot of other things, but if you blow right past uh, good design and you don't get outside help or invest in training, you know, trying to save the cost or, you know, trying to save on uh, what you might spend on doing a good design, um, you kind of, you know, you go down some bad roads. On the other hand, if you invest in training, uh, you save yourself, you know, cost and angst down the road when it comes to expensive rework. And basically, you know, poor design works against reliability. That's all there is to it. There can work against uh, reliability. Sometimes people get really lucky, <laughs> but it's not the it's not the rule. It's more the exception um, when you kind of just throw it together. So, um, code bugs. Boy, that is um, one of my hot buttons, and the reason I get so passionate about it is it's kind of beyond our control, right? We can do a lot of other things. You know, we can instrument ourselves out the wazoo looking for um, all the things that systems like Seven Signal and the, you know, competing, uh, you know, uh, performance KPI based stuff tries to identify and pull out. But we don't have a lot of defense against code bugs. So when the vendors hand us something um, that just doesn't work very well, or it's erratic, or it's um, you know takes reliability and does weird things with it, um, that's not good. And again, it puts us in a really uncomfortable uh, 
position and absolutely I've had my share of them. Um, you know, to say that they are performance killers at times is just a, an understatement. So, um, you know, this is probably the one that I circle and, um, you know, put red asterisks next to and as I stare at it, I start getting really, really uh, emotional and weird and, you know, maybe I, maybe I quiver a little bit too, so. <laughs> Uh, when we move on to uh, client driver issues, boy, it's it's really sad that this is still a thing. Um, you know, given how long wireless networking has been out there, given how long uh, you know laptops and mobile devices have been with us, it, it's just you know kind of defies logic that this is still a thing. But unfortunately, it is, especially with Windows. Uh, thankfully, Apple tends to have their house in order pretty good. Um, you know, so does Android if, in my experience, but when it comes to Windows devices, you've still got that weird mix of, you know, the hardware and the software and the drivers and the adapters all maybe are sourced from different places. So there's a lot of, you know, places for things to, or a lot of junctures where things might not be all that uh, smooth and, you know, well put together. Um, and it's kind of weird as the wireless standards get more complex, you know, 11N, 11AC, now 11AX, as the standards get more complex and we have more, you know, options and more features and more, you know, maybe use this in this situation, maybe not use it in another situation, all of these little odd things um, going on under the hood for um, the more complex standards the drivers also get more complex and more complicated. And even though we know that we're supposed to be working under the you know, umbrella heading of standards, the vendors still have their own methodologies for implementing so many things. So client driver issues, um, you know, they're with us, they're going to stay with us. It doesn't even touch the IOT stuff and all the, you know, the wonky frozen in time printer problems and all of that that are out there. So um, there is a lot here. You know, this is a this is an hour's worth of discussion um, by itself, but we'll just leave that there and move on. Um, what I'm calling, you know, not tending your RF garden, uh, plain and simple, this is frequency coordination. You know, when it comes to the physical layer of wireless, the actual RF side of the house, um, you know, we're more or less defenseless or at best pretty weak against competing signals you know wi-fi is made to be robust you know as far as like auto you know rate shifting and you know stuff like that as you get further away from the cell you know clients try to uh, clients in the ap try to um, keep talking to each other etc but boy once you start introducing the wrong kind of uh, competing signal in the mix and you know basically we get jammed um, you know, in the Air Force, this was electronic warfare. You know, bad signals show up and, you know, the, the stuff that you need to see and use is obliterated by the wrong competing signal. So, um, you know, take any football game, take any big stadium event, um, you know, even concerts, you're going to find frequency coordination. What is it that you're trying to bring in? What frequency does it work at? What power levels does it work at? What's the modulation? If you don't at least give all of this a tacit consideration, you're gonna be kind of doomed. Um, you know, if you get the wrong stuff, wireless microphones, for example, in the same auditorium where you're trying to do Wi-Fi and you've made a poor technology choice, um, you know, you, you have to have some control or at least knowledge of the competing devices that are in your environment. And again, this is what I'm calling the uh, the RF garden, and you really do need to tend it. In the 2.4 band, just to put the ribbons on this bullet, in the 2.4 band, um, if you go you know, back to the um, you know, umbrella heading of what goes on there, we're operating in the industrial, scientific, and medical band. And each one of those has all kinds of its own devices that Wi-Fi competes with. So that ISM band, especially, you know, when we talk about the RF garden, 2.4 is certainly more subject to getting walloped 
uh, but five gig is not immune. We're starting to see more and more stuff in five gig that also kind of, um, you know, replays history as far as 2.4, uh, you know, kind of getting beat up pretty good along the way. So, and then finally, the notion of, uh, you know, the underlying network, if it is shoddy, if it's not built well, really may not matter um, that you've got everything else right. You know, if you've got problems underneath, Wi-Fi works at layer one, layer two. You've got a whole rest of the network you still have to uh, work with and you know work on top of. So, if the rest of the equation, you know, everything from poor cabling to poor core services, you know, any of that can make the wireless um, feel bad. So you just can't discount the rest of the network. I shall flip the slide. So on that last topic, you know, the, um, you know, the, the notion of a shoddy underlying network or problems that make wireless performance feel like it's not uh, doing what it should, even though it may not be the wireless network itself. If you were to Google, um, you know, the soon to be famous cocktail napkin, it's a blog I wrote that has come to be uh, often copied sometimes improved um, it's gotten to be really popular i've gotten a lot of people saying hey can i kind of change this and make it a little nicer than you did it they might be prettier but they're certainly not as sassy as the original and the idea was to put together kind of a really uh, off the cuff holistic view of all the other factors that can make wi-fi seem bad even if it's not so if you're not familiar with this Famous work of art, uh, famous work of uh, journalistic excellence. I encourage you to take a look. And I'll I'll drop that uh, URL into the chat, uh, Lee. Sounds good. Thanks, Don. So we'll leave and pivot away from you know the um, bullets that I gave you under performance killers, and now we'll go over to reputation. And again, when I talk about reputation, this is organizational reputation. You know, the, the reputation of the IT, everything from the help desk to you and I as network engineers and architects. And ultimately, you know, CIO is on the hook for the reputation. If you've got a CIO who says, you know, the, the buck stops with me, I'm responsible for all of this stuff. And if you like your CIO and you like your managers and your directors and your fellow man, uh, you know, you want everybody to, to have a good reputation when it comes to doing good wireless. So that's the kind of stuff when I say reputation, um, you know, that's as much of what we're trying to preserve as the reputation of the wireless network itself. And hopefully, hopefully that makes sense as I babble away here. So Again, I've got them all here on the same slide. Um, not a lot to flip through, but we'll talk about them in order. To me, you know, having been doing this for as many years as I have, I have come to truly value the benefits of having strong wireless policies. Um, you know, all of the things that we just mentioned can certainly bear on reputation, but if you don't have good policies, it's really hard to put together good solutions. If you're, if there's not any, you know, like I used to be on a, you know, I used to be the deputy mayor of our little village and I was always impressed by uh, Robert's rules of order, you know, the way that you conduct meetings and, you know, just the, the things that keep you on track. And, you know, that was the policy and in that setting is, you know, this is, this is how we do things. And if you don't have that stated, you know, this is how we do things. This is what's allowed. This is what's not allowed. And you don't have executive buy-in on those policies, which makes them enforceable. You're kind of just floating in the wind. People come to you and say, hey, I want to do this. Uh, yeah, um, okay, uh, sure, why not? Or no, because I say no. It, you know, it's just, you really want the policies to help you know how to um, not only build systems, but also configure them and how to interact with people on the subject of what the wireless can do and um, what it can support and what it can't support. So um, when it comes to policies, a lot of people skip right past them. 
a lot of times you get into a customer that has no policy, you have to help them to arrive at one if they don't, because it does bear directly on um, system operation, at, at least in my mind. So um, hopefully that squares with everybody listening. Um, inconsistent messaging about the, the wireless network. Boy, this is another one that can be um, really, really frustrating. In my world, I preach that you know, if the wireless network is designed well and it's healthy, almost all wireless issues are going to be client related. Um, again, it's on a healthy wireless network that's been well designed. If you can get your IT staff to buy into that, again, this is just my philosophy, and you go right to the client end for troubleshooting first, and you don't have everybody saying, oh, maybe the network sucks. Maybe there's something we gotta tweak over here. Maybe there's some timer we re need to reset. If you can get confidence in the network across the board and everybody is talking about it the same way, now oh, the network is usually good. Let's look at the client. That in itself is an asset, just building that culture, just doing away with the inconsistent messaging. Nothing is worse than somebody on the help desk saying, you know, I got two calls about this one building. We must have weak spots in that building. And all of a sudden you got gossip going around. Oh, that building sucks. There's weak spots. And it's just, you know, call it loose lips, sink ships, whatever. Um, you know, <laughs> it, it's not good. That also kind of gets us into the lack of trust in the network, um, you know, by the IT staff. <sighs> You know, I guess you can probably make the case that those two things um, go together. But when I say the IT staff, again, I am talking, um, you know, help desk, the doers, the installers, all the way up to the CIO. Um, really sucks when the CIO, for example, makes an offhand comment about, yeah, I couldn't attach in blah, blah, blah. And you've got an overreactive staff member that, you know, all of a sudden they're spreading the word. Yeah, the network really sucked at that meeting for the boss and pretty soon you know everybody wants to please the big guy or big gal and all of a sudden um you know years of building up credibility for the network is just kind of blown away by you know blown up gossip again it's just you know building the culture of trust building the tr culture of confidence it's it's a you know, good defense against having your your reputation killed off. Uh, speaking of the knee jerk, um, disruptive reactions, uh, you know, kind of getting into that mode instead of delivering stability. And I'll stick with that one example. The wrong person said something about the network. So I got scared, I couldn't really find any problems, but boy, he, he's pretty hot. I better change something. I gotta change, I changed some timer. I, I upped the power on his APs. I, I did something because the wrong person, you know, had a problem and, you know, therefore I'm gonna go make things worse by doing all kinds of, well, I almost said an off color term for what we call it in the Air Force when you just start <laughs> turning knobs and doing doing things that are just counterproductive uh, for the sake of doing something. And I'm guessing that almost everybody listening has done that at some point. I don't really know what I'm doing. Let's just try this. But boy, it, it makes things worse. And, you know, when you're trying to protect your reputation, you really want to think twice about that. Uh, sort of action. And again, back to the code, uh, issue of code quality. You know, for me, and the vendor, vendors that I've used, I don't want to pick on any one. Um, you know, you get catastrophic code bugs and it's easy to get busy fixing the problem. I am a fixer. I wanna make that problem go away. I open up my support case and you know I put my head down and even though it's something that the vendor has originated and they're asking me to do all kinds of stupid things and all of that, all anybody locally knows, your users, your management team, all anybody knows unless you make it clear is that the network is bad. Well, you run the network, therefore you must be doing something wrong. If you've got a bona fide 
declared code issue in my mind you know shame on you for holding that bag and not you know identifying to everybody you know <laughs> whether it's just your you know standard communications we have a network problem this is what we're dealing with name and shame if it is not your fault if it is not your responsibility if human error didn't do something stupid if if you know this is truly a vendor problem um you know say so let everybody know yeah we're dealing with we're working with the vendor to solve this but absolutely um, absolve yourself of the responsibility of bearing that cross you know, my own philosophy and then finally we get to the uh the last where we say uh, yes to everything or we say no to everything you know if you try to accommodate every wild thing under the sun that somebody wants to put on your wireless network you know we've still got devices that demand to use legacy b rates for example um, we've got things that need weird little zones of multicast we've got things that need everything to be on the same class c network or they don't work wired and wireless we, we've got the most bizarre mix of consumer and enterprise devices and now i guess you could even throw the iot um you know with the rising iot tide you can throw that in the mix we've got all of this crazy disparate uh goings on in the client space and if you try to accommodate everything you're just going to cripple your network at the same time if you become the no store everybody who comes to you for anything is met with no you know you either look turfy power hungry uncreative or you cripple your network by saying yes to everything so somewhere in the middle you've got to find what you can support and sometimes you have to kind of stretch your own policies and maybe do little secret mac exceptions through the guest gateway for some problematic device and even though you don't really want to do it it makes sense for the situation and you do it on a handshake and a gentleman's agreement i can make this happen but don't tell anyone else and if you do i'm going to take it away from you i mean you have to be creative you have to be um, flexible to a point but again, if you take either the, uh, the yes or the no um, notion too far, uh, you go too far in either direction, um, you know, you're going to find that your reputation is, is kind of, you know, taking some punishment from that as well. So hopefully, going through both of those uh, data points or bullet lists or whatever you want to call them, has sparked some uh, recognition or some questions or some realization or you think i'm full of beans and my little pug dog june wants to talk about it if there's any anything to talk about she's a good girl that was uh, that was excellent um thanks a lot lee jim is gonna moderate the chat for us on this one and and pull out some questions and then we've got another trivia question we're going to ask everybody uh, so, Jim, I'll, I'll turn it over for, to you for the moderation, if you don't mind. Yeah, and thanks, Lee. That was really good. I, I've got a lot of my own questions and comments, but uh, I'll, I'll defer to our uh, audience here, our attendees, uh, for the moment. So, uh, here's a question. You started off, we were talking about uh, wireless design being a problem, and Harry says, what is the signal level you should use in ECHA when designing? Minus 65 dBm or minus 60 dBm? Um, well, <clears throat> my answer to that is it depends on what you're designing for. And, you know, if it's voice over IP, the specific handsets might have a stated value that this is what you should be designing for, the, the manufacturer, whatever. Um, I don't know if there is an across the board rule. If you're talking just um, generally, again, it comes down to the devices that you're gonna be supporting. And I always kind of feel like that's a cop out because when somebody says that to me, um, my, my immediate reaction is, um, come on, how do we know what devices are gonna be there, really? I mean, you, depending on the, the environment, if it's a, if it's a uh, warehouse or if it's a medical environment or whatever, you have some, 
notion, hopefully, of what the devices are going to be. But like in a university or a you know public space, a mall or whatever, you're going to get anything and everything. You know, whatever people have on them is what you're supporting, and what what is in place on day one is going to change by day six or certainly you know 12 months out or whatever. So I don't really have an answer. Other than I think it would be reckless to say it's one value, um, therefore run with it. I have spoken. I, th I think that would be a reckless answer. I think it really comes down to what you're supporting and what's recommended, I guess, is the safe way of answering that. Yeah. Yeah, there really there's is. a lot. There's a lot to talk about there. I know I'm uh, kind of kind of ripping it off, but go ahead, Jim. What's your thought? No, you're I, I agree. There really is no one size fits all. Um, standard. There are some best practices depending on the vertical and the, the devices, but uh, then you get into device specific RSSI values and it's it's quite a rabbit hole. But uh, just curiously, you know, in higher education where you spend most of your time, are there, you know, kind of rules of thumb that you use with, you know, the BYOD networks and high density that you have to support? Um. I can't speak for all of higher ed because I know everybody kind of does it a little bit different. I know if you go back approximately 300 years to when I went to Cisco Site Survey School, um, you know, back when DIRT was being invented and they came out with 802.11b, uh, I think it was NAG 67 and I think the SNR that you were shooting for was always like 25. Those have always stuck with me, but at the same time, you know, there's other things like, okay, depending on if you can pull it off, you always want three high quality APs that uh, the user can connect to in a given area or certainly two, you know, depending on what your resiliency is and your, you know, your redundancy is blah, 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 but you want that primary cell. Again, depending on what devices you expect to support, it's either gonna be NEG 65, it's gonna be NEG 67, um, your tool is going to probably not know the difference and all, you know, none of these are really calibrated tools that we're using generally. So to me, if you're kind of in the range of that, um, all of our adapters are going to be a little bit different. If you don't get into the world of offsets, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, again, you know, really neg 65, neg 67, decent, good SNR, blah, blah, blah. Thankfully, I don't have to support support voice over wireless, so I can be a little more cavalier about it. But um, you know, generally, that's where we are: three good usable cells, where we can get away with it in an HD environment uh, at any point in a given room or a facility, and um, where we can't pull that off. You certainly want at least two, um, which even in some of our uh, townhouse style uh, residence facilities that are built like fortresses you you can't pull that off and um, that's where at least knowing that the one cell that is available to people is always up comes you know is very important is just as important as you know the design uh, for that knowing that you've got a lot of constraints so I, I just babbled and babbled didn't I Jim did I even come <laughs> close to answering your question that's perfect no you, you'd bank a great sales engineer that's perfect. <laughs> here's a uh, here's a question from uh, from David. Uh, can you and I, I like this question because I think it's provocative. Can you give us some examples of the most common code bugs? Uh, generally, they tend to be um, non standards based features. Band steering has been a a pain in my backside off and on through the years. Nowhere in the 802.11 standard does it talk about, you know, band steering. Every vendor has their own um, special sauce on that. That's been a big one. Where you take non-wireless features, you know, let, let's talk about like application visibility and control. Um, you know, it's like it's an add-on to 802.11. It's got nothing to do with 802.11, but say your controller, if you use that architecture, is also doing that. That has been an absolute thorn in the side. You know, all of the things that go into the super systems and kind of deviate beyond basic 802.11, um, you know, specific client access, any of the extras can be problematic. 
Um, a lot of problems don't manifest until you hit some kind of um, large scale. So, you know, a, one of the cop outs I hear is, oh, you got to test your code. You know, how dare you deploy code without testing it? You, you get what you deserve if you didn't test it. Okay, so how do you test? You know, I can put six APs in a lab and throw 50 clients at it, but the problem doesn't show up until I've got 30,000 clients running against, you know, 2,000 APs, and then the problems show up. And that's the manufacturer's job to test at those scales. So, you know, hopefully the, the easy answer is a lot of the secret sauce type stuff is where the bugs live. The non-802.11 stuff is where the bugs live. In the interest of time, I'll shut myself up there. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we have a good comment come from uh, John who says, uh, regarding the RSSI question, I suggest uh, checking out the CWNA CWDP certifications, and I agree that's a good way to get the knowledge to be able to tackle that question uh, on your own. Uh, maybe one last short question, Lee, uh, from Alan. He says, wireless design, is it worth allowing the user to use two routers and home Wi-Fi while teleworking to work? Uh Boy, um, that's a Quizzler, isn't it? It well, is. Well, is it? Uh, I, I like everything else, and it it just feels weird to even say it. You know, it depends. <laughs> How big is your house? You know, what are you trying to accomplish with those two routers? Is it like one for me and one for the rest of the family? Do you have two ISP connections? Is one router downstream from the other router? I mean, what what is it that you're going for? Um, in this, but at the same time, from purely the RF perspective, if you're doing channel management and power management and you don't have to rely on roaming from one to the other to be seamless, you know, there's no harm in it. Theoretically, there's all kinds of ways to accommodate it, but you've still got to do, you know, good configuration on each one of those routers. But um, so can you? Absolutely. Should you? Maybe. Depends on what you're trying to do. And um, like with anything, uh, wireless or networking, there's usually, you know, several ways to achieve what you're trying to achieve. And if two routers is suitable for what it is you're trying to achieve, there's no harm in doing it. You know. All right. In the right in the right situation. Great. Thanks so much, Lee. Really appreciate you. Uh coming on and, and giving our keynote today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Lee. So, uh, Jim, I think we've got a trivia question here. Am I right? It's, yeah. And it's, I think it's, is it supposed to be easier than the first one? Um, uh, it's uh, it's kind of hard. <laughs> okay. And I blame, this is Don's fault, so send him the nasty grams. He said, come up with some hard questions. <laughs> You didn't actually have to do what I said. Well, I thought I thought there would be like a prize if you got it right or something like that. Uh, so, uh, and you bring up a good point. I should have mentioned that the first time. So I will see who answers the question correctly. The first person to answer the the uh, the question correctly, so you will get a prize. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, oh, good. Seven signal, seven signal swag uh, for the first person who answers the question correctly. Um, so this question, as you all see it here, what is the highest MCS index value during uh, dot 11 AC operation for 20 megahertz channel width? And it looks like the answer stopped coming through. So let me close and share. And uh, I think they did better on this one. Am there I right? Go. They did do better. The majority answered MCS 9, which is correct. You might get tripped up and think it's MCS 8. That's why I, I added that. Uh, qualifier about a 20 megahertz channel width just to make it a little bit more difficult because in one and two spatial stream operation there is no mcs9 with a 20 megahertz wide channel but for three spatial stream operation there is mcs9 so there you have it everybody i think grabbed this wlan pros chart and was trying to find exactly where it was everyone's got one of those at their side yes <laughs> well, I've uh, I've handed the controls over to Eric Camuli, our VP of Customer Success. 
Uh, Eric's got a great presentation for us today, and he's also going to introduce our customer speakers as well. Um, so Eric, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Don, and thank you, Lee, and everybody else. So <clears throat> I just want to speak for a couple minutes about customer success here at Seven Signal, so that you really understand what our what our strategy is, and it's really a strategy around educate and empower. Uh, just so as you all are familiar with the webinar series that Don puts on, we're trying to really elevate the level of knowledge out there with regards to Wi-Fi. Uh, we know that uh, it's uh, we we know that that Wi-Fi has kind of always been secondary, and those times are changing. And so now it's time that, you know, for some of us who kind of grew up in the ethernet world and the networking world, that we need to start sharpening our skills when it comes to Wi-Fi. And that's what we're all about. We really wanna come alongside you and help out with that. You know, as a result, um, we do have the webinar series and we do also have a lot of resources to, available to you online, not just our YouTube channel, but one resource that our customers have been really taking advantage of over, over the past number of months is our new info.7signal.com website. Specifically, I'm talking about the instructional video section where you have the opportunity to walk through our software, not only learn about how our software works so that you can be successful, in, but also learning about Wi-Fi and how Wi-Fi works. You really, you can't have one without the other. And again, that just supports our whole strategy of let's educate and empower our customers so that they have the knowledge to make determinations, to find and fix problems, to make recommendations, uh, and, uh, and, and empower them to do so. So I just want to invite everybody to come to the website, info.7signal.com, go to the instructional video section that I have up right here. And what you'll see are, again, minute videos that allow you to not only learn about our software, but allow you to learn about Wi-Fi in kind of a, a beginner to intermediate level. It's important to note, if you want to get into the expert stuff, then, you know, I'm going to hand the baton off to Jim and, and his team. The other thing uh, that I wanted to also mention is we do have or do give you the opportunity to get certified. So if I click over here, what you'll see is the opportunity to test your knowledge, test your skills. It's a 50 question uh, quiz, if you will. And importantly is that it does test your knowledge regarding Wi-Fi and basic Wi-Fi principles and basic Wi-Fi troubleshooting, in addition to testing your knowledge of how to use the seven signal system. So you want to be able to use the seven signal system in order to find and fix, in order to make recommendations, uh, in order to inform your decisions about moving forward. And so that's available to you as well. And then if you pass, you'll not only get a certificate and you can also download this cool little icon uh, badge for your LinkedIn profile, but you'll also appear on our... And so if you want your name to prominently appear, then I invite you to take advantage, and I'm really curious to, to see how many of you do. That's all I want to say about customer success. Again, we do want to be a resource for you. Um, the, we'll do everything that we can in order to help you make your Wi-Fi network the best it can be using the tools and the knowledge that we have. So please, uh, just want to make sure that that's clear to everybody out there. So with that said, I want to transition into speaking or having our customers speak about how these systems, these tools have helped them. And uh, what we have is a, a nice lineup of our customers here who have volunteered to spend just a couple of minutes talking about themselves, their organization, and how 7Signal has helped them. And then if you do have questions, please put them into the question pane. And then when we get to the end of all of our speakers, we'll throw out a couple of different questions to them. And also I would like to invite you to pay close attention because we will ask a question at the very end uh, regarding what we learned and what we heard from our speakers today. And if you get that question correct, you will win, as Don said, seven signal swag. So with that, I'm gonna uh, introduce our first speaker. Ernesto Fernandez from Advent Health. Ernesto, how are you? 
I'm doing good, Derek. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, like Eric said, uh, my name is Ernesto Fernandez. I am with Advent Health. I've been working at Advent Health as a um, wireless engineer for now, it's going to be two years. And we started using 7Signal about, uh, I would say, six to seven months ago. And one of the one of the um, occasions where using 7Signal actually really helped um, with uh, finding some of the issues we had. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, one of the one of the situations was um, in one of our locations. We are a healthcare organization. We also have uh, different environments. One of those environments is a warehouse where we had some some reportings where usually those reportings come in as uh, the Wi-Fi is not working. I'm pretty sure you all heard that before, where you know we get those type of reports and nothing to pretty much um, uh, say what what the problem is usually. So we deploy seven signal to that location, and what we find out um, during during the deployment and during the first assessment was that the Wi-Fi was just working fine. There was no issues with the Wi-Fi, and the majority of the problem that we were seeing it was communication between the devices. Which, by the way, these devices were um, little hand handheld scanners. Uh, Zebra, specifically uh, the TC51s um, models on, on the Zebra lineup. And they were having issues communicating with the, the inventory software uh, server um, at that, lo uh, that location. Um, we were also had some visibility into uh, the, the Zebra devices performance and um, and and some of them were also associating to our guest SSID instead of uh, our on our admin SSID, which at this point those devices were administered administrated by um, the uh, our software MDM, and there were mandatory profiles to use our admin SSIDs, so they shouldn't have been on on our guest SSID. Uh, some of those devices also were jumping over to uh, 2.4, and they were mandated to be on the 5 gigahertz. So we we came across um, a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that we were seeing that was causing some some of the issues. And in this slide right here, you can see that the the Wi-Fi performance wasn't a, um, it wasn't a problem. Um, we could see different different um, matrix uh, enrollment coverage. Um, the CCI wasn't uh, an issue, ACI wasn't an issue. So we were really trying to figure it out what the problem was um, and when we came to, to this kind of um, um, uh, situation, we came across that, that the, we were pinging the, the server for the device, and I apologize for my grandson just screaming in the background. <laughs> no um, and uh, we we came across the the pinging connectivity to the to the particular server that we the the devices were trying to use, um, and we saw that the problem lied on 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 that type of communication. We also um, were looking at the when the devices were uh, going over to basically the guest network and they were not supposed to they were profiled to be on our admin network and and they were going over to the guest obviously at that point there is no communication to that to that server and they were complaining of network issues at that point or that wi-fi is not working um we also were um here and i can show you where we 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 were able to set up the test to go ping that that server and here we can see we have our sonar server here and we have also the application server that the devices we're trying to communicate with 
um, we, we can see also full visibility into the devices where at the time of, of the issues where they were having connectivity problems or were pinging connectivity problems with those uh, application servers, the signal was just no problem with the signal strength, data rates were good, channel, and, and different matrix on, on the on the Wi-Fi network that uh, indicated that the, the wireless was operating as it's supposed to, and there was a uh, connectivity to that server. Um, here we can see a um, few devices where we had devices jumping over to the 2.4 um, network instead of the the 5 gigahertz where they were mandated to to operate on um, and this uh, problems with that since 2.4 is so saturated in different environments and um, it, it actually one one of the uh, funny things that happened during this investigation is that one of one of the devices that was kept on jumping over to the 2.4 was actually my laptop. My own laptop was jumping over to the 2.4 instead of uh, staying on the 5 gigahertz. And since then, we we um, we worked with different departments to institute the group policies and the and the profiles and from MDM uh, to very better make sure that those devices stay within their 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 limit and where they're supposed to be on the network and from there we have better operations and uh, it, it, the visibility that we got from the mobile eye was uh, very crucial to that and and being able to figure out what this this problem was at this point and I don't know if I'm over my time but um, that's great Ernesto. that was Thank pretty you. much it yeah, outstanding. And you know, you bring up a really good point, Ernesto, just with regards to sometimes you got to play defense. You know, people have a tendency to just blame the Wi-Fi network for everything because they're connected to the Wi-Fi network. But as you pointed out very clearly, um, you know, sometimes, and, and this gets back to what Lee was talking about, defending yourself, defending your reputation. Um, you know, it's not always it's not always the Wi-Fi network. So thank you for that. That was great stuff. Really appreciate it. Uh, so now we're going to move on, and we're going to, yeah, you betcha. So now we're going to move on to Tony Kamudson from, uh, and Tony, if if you're there, um, let's have you share and uh, have you introduce yourself and and tell us about your experiences with Seventh Signal. Go right ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, a little bit, um, a little static, but uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. Um, can you guys see me? Here's my uh, my webcam on. It doesn't seem like it's on. Anyway, uh, I'm with Kaiser Permanente. Um, we've been using Seven Signals for about uh, two and a half years. Um, we kind of use this uh, both from both perspectives, the, the, the Sapphire Eye and the Mobile Eye. And we kind of use it um, more of a, as a troubleshooting tool. We actually send these out to different locations that are having whatever perceived wireless issue. And I kind of uh, harken back to the, the last presenter. Everybody wants to point at wireless right away uh, and say it's it's bad wireless. And there could be so many other things. But um, the particular case that I that I wanted to talk about, uh, can you guys see my screen or not? Yes. Yeah, we sure can. OK. so. Um, one of the issues we are having currently, and I went and looked at this this morning, so it's just a screen capture that I got uh, when I was going through, so I'm sending out some emails, and I was actually late uh, getting to the, this meeting. I hope I was hoping my time didn't come up uh, beforehand. But if you, if you guys can see here, um, it, it's very evident that uh, we have an issue with an AP that bonded very, it didn't bond correctly, and so we're having uh, co-channel interference, you can see right there that we have two APs totally stepping on one another. And so I just wanted to bring that up really quick because of this particular site, we have saw some very unusual things where APs are flipping back and forth between 20 megahertz and 40 megahertz. And we believe it's a bug in the new, this newer software that we deployed. Um, and again, this is a, a Cisco system. It's, uh, it's on a 5508. 
and I believe these are 37, no, these were just changed out to the 3800s, I believe, 3802s. And so we were having a lot of issues because as everybody knows that uh, with the COVID, especially with uh, healthcare, um, a lot of the stuff that we're doing uh, is, is almost transformed the way we deliver healthcare. Um, everybody's went to these telehealth visits and we've had an 800% increase in telehealth visits. And so what we're finding, and I guess we, I've known this for probably a couple of years due to seven signal and, and mobile eye, but we have some gaps uh, when it comes to having a, a video ready network that can, um, that can actually deliver what really needs to be for the customer and for the doctor to have a good, you know, a uh, good medical visit. And so, again, this is one of the issues that we were having. We didn't know we were having this issue until I looked this morning to see uh, actually what's going on in that environment. And this um, seven signal device is actually deployed in a doctor's meadow. So it's where all the doctors go, usually when they go do their notes and that type of thing, but they're actually having these video visits from their, their, that, this alcove that contains about seven or eight different uh, uh, doctors. And they're not all there at every, any one time, but there, there could be three or four people just in this alcove. So to hear that they were having video issues yesterday, I wanted to come take a look and, and see what was happening. Because again, we also use the mobile eye and some of the mobile eye uh, clients that we had, we have probably 15 deployed at this location uh, on those doctors' laptops see what was happening see from that mobile eye client that indeed sometimes the EPs are switching from the 40 megahertz bonded channel to a 20 megahertz bonded channel and back and so that disrupts um you guys can imagine those video visits um you get to see you know um sometimes one-way audio uh, totally garbled speech um very pixelized uh type of visits um but anyway, I just wanted to go over something fresh. I didn't, I was gonna make a presentation, but the when this came up, I thought it was too good to, uh, to not present. Yeah, this is great. Thank you, Tony. Um, you know, you bring up something really interesting now. I mean, uh, oh my gosh. I mean, remember when the COVID thing um, began and everybody was at home. I mean, just, uh, it was now all of a sudden we couldn't hardly log in to go to meeting because of just the absolute load on the network. And whether it be Zoom or Teams or Skype or GoToMeeting or WebEx or whatever it is, I mean, just the increase, like you had mentioned, is yeah. just through the Absolutely. roof. Absolutely, it's just because it was, yeah, it was it was fundamentally different because we, you know, even when we had so many users, we we went from like a thousand users at home to eight to eight thousand. <laughs> wow. And an 800% increase in telehealth. That's incredible. Yeah, amazing. Well, Tony, thank you very much. Uh, great, great stuff. And thank you for bringing to to our attention just an awesome, relevant, you know, current event and, and great example. So now what we're going to do is we're going to switch. Uh, we're going to switch. And again, if you have questions for any of our speakers, please um, put them into the question pane so that we'll get to those at the end. But let's keep moving here. Next, we're going to talk to Nick Looper. Nick, if you're there. Uh, let's give you the opportunity and hand it on over to you to introduce yourself and, and share your stories with us. Go ahead, Nick. Sure. Uh, okay. Yeah, Nick Cooper, yeah. um, wireless engineer with uh, Fortune 500 company. Um, yeah, uh, CWNA, CWSP, uh, CCNA, CCNA Wireless, and use the seven signal, several of the tools for uh, troubleshooting in our organization. So I just wanted to share a couple of use cases. Um, let me share my screen right here. Um, all right, sharing the, the proper screen. All right, which it may not be, but that's okay. We can see your blue uh, windows screen. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure why it's not showing the, the right monitor, but wait a second. I think it's changing. 
I see a black screen. Mm. If, and um, so underneath the screen right. pane, um, you'll see a drop down underneath the play button. It'll say screen one, screen two, yep. screen three. Yep. Okay. Let's see here. Mm -hmm. Actually, go. I'll just go through some of the bullets that I was going to talk about. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So, mm -hmm. okay, good. excellent. So, one of the things we've used um, Mobileye for are to quantify performance differences between different drivers, different driver versions. Um, you know, obviously, as, as wireless professionals, we know that different network adapters have different characteristics, whether it's one, two, three spatial streams. But, you know, we found with Mobileye great differences in performance, even between the same adapter running different driver versions. So here's some data from um, over a period of the last two months. And we have a lot of this Intel, uh, many instances of the Intel dual band wireless 82, AC8260. Um, and, you know, here we found driver version 20.70.11.3 we had better performance, um, whereas this uh, 20.50.1.1 have a lot more um, sticky roaming behavior. You know, where the where the client has options available, but for some reason chooses not to roam, um, remains associated to um, a, a weaker AP. Now, of course, you you can't always say there could be other factors that um, are causing the issue beyond the driver. But if you have a fairly, if you have more than just one or two clients exhibiting this sticky behavior on the same driver and NIC version combination, you know, you can make some conclusions, draw some conclusions. So that's really been uh, helpful for us. Um, another point, another thing that Mobilize um, allowed us to do, I like the comments made so far that sometimes it shows that Wi-Fi isn't the issue, right? Um, there are times when, like like everybody, like others have said, we get a report that the, the Wi-Fi isn't working well. Um, so we'll start to research the issue. And as we take a look, we find uh, we have a sonar, several of our sites on the internal network, on the local LAN, as well as Seven Signals cloud sonars. So here's an example where um, to the local LAN, we were getting about 70 megabits per second, both up and down from this client, but out to a cloud sonar, only, you know, maybe 17 megabits per second. So certainly for a lot of applications, that would still be sufficient, but depending on the use case, maybe it isn't. So to be able to show the customer, or maybe one of our peers in another IT group, um, that, hey, we're, we're Wi-Fi is providing quality link to the local LAN, so we need to focus our investigation maybe somewhere else in the infrastructure. Um, so those are a couple examples for uh, Mobileye. Um, others are for Sapphire Eye, and I don't have any slides for those, so I can actually stop uh, sharing my desktop. Um, now, for Sapphire Eye, we had a uh, we've had several cases where we notice radius server, radius authentication failures. And um, again, if someone fails to authenticate to a wireless LAN, it's always, it's always the network, right? It's always wireless. But we had a situation where we saw that client, the, the sensor was associating just fine, but all of the authentication attempts were failing. And you know, folks who have a controller-based architecture, you know that the controllers usually have a list of radius servers. And if one stops responding or you get, uh, it responds over a set threshold, controller will fail over to the next radius server. Well, um, we had an instance where, the, although the radius server was responding, it wasn't talking to Active Directory properly anymore. So the wireless controller never failed over. But um, we started receiving alerts from Sapphire Eye about the authentication failures. So I was able to ping our, our network operations and security operations group, and they were, they were able to get that corrected. But the controller itself, like the, the infrastructure monitoring tools wouldn't have reported any issues because radius server communication was happening. Um,
but from a client's perspective, it was broken. So that was a that was a good experience. Um, another situation was, and there are a lot of metrics you could report on with you know IQ or or Analyzer. So these are just a couple that uh, stood out in in our case. Um, we saw high DHCP offer times, and you know you've probably experienced this before, um, where your device gets a 169.254 auto assigned IP. It it gave up. Um, it, it after so many seconds, whether it's eight or ten or more seconds, and we were occasionally noticing that. Um, from we we're occasionally getting reports from clients, and as we looked at the uh, Sapphire Eye data, we saw that yeah, in fact, some DHCP offer times were exceeding eight, ten, twelve, fifteen seconds, um, and we just drove us to you know check out the DHCP servers. Um, in our infrastructure, they happen to be virtually hosted, and we found in our ho in our VM hosting infrastructure, um, they were at you know 99% RAM utilization. In some cases, 99% CPU utilization. Um, it actually was again, it wasn't the Wi-Fi in that case, but it it was making the Wi-Fi look bad. Um, so we were able to correct resource issues on the DHCP infrastructure and restore service. Um, so yeah. Some some have commented, well, well, it wasn't your job to to solve the problem for another infrastructure team, but it sort of is. If it's like Lee was talking about, if it's our reputation on the line, we have to at least give them enough data to look at their their equipment. Um, so, and then uh, lastly, just real briefly, there was folks who work in the Cisco world um, with the 2702 and 3702 APs. There was an ROS bug where the AP would stop and stop responding to association requests. So it would beacon for an SSID. The client would try to associate, but the AP would just not respond to the association request. Again, AP was up, radios were up. From the infrastructure monitoring tools, you would never see a problem. But Seven Signal was like the SFRIs were like, "Hey, uh, this AP is not answering. Something's wrong." Um, and we're able to follow up with the vendor and and resolve that issue. So, yeah, just a couple of experiences where it uh, helped it in my organization. Yeah, Nick, you bring up something really interesting just with regards to, you know, sometimes organizations point fingers at one another. You know, if you have information in front of you, then that kind of dissipates a little bit. Hey, let's look at the information together. You know, can you see what I'm seeing here? And it makes for kind of a less contentious relationship. Do you find that taking place? Yeah, definitely. So it's funny. Um, one of my colleagues who manages the DHCP systems or, or works in the management of them asked if he could get access to Sapphire Eye. He's like, man, this is great data. I want to, I want to be able to dive into this a little bit more. So. And, and in another case, it wasn't even their fault. It was a vendor bug. It was uh, their responsibility, but they were able to escalate it with the, vent, the vendor who made the DHCP software and get it resolved. So, yeah. so that was helpful. That's awesome. Awesome stuff. Thanks, Nick. Really appreciate you sharing like that. Yep. So now we're gonna uh, we're gonna turn it over to our final uh, customer, who's gonna tell a story or two uh, about Seven Signal and how it was able to help them in their environment. I'm going to turn it over to Todd. Todd O'Brien, if you're out there, let's give control over to you and allow you the opportunity to share a little bit. And once again, if you do have questions for our sure. group, please uh, please do that. But Todd uh, from International uh, Paper, take it away. Sure. Uh, I actually don't have anything to show on my screen, but uh, <clears throat> I can talk to you about how we've used uh, the product uh, mobile eye. I, I work for international paper. I'm the Wi-Fi infrastructure uh, architect here. And um, we have 54,000 employees, about 500 locations where we have manufacturing. And our Wi-Fi challenge really is the manufacturing plant floor um, where we uh, <clears throat> where we see the most issues and we get the uh, uh, customers that uh, voice the loudest complaints. Um, we're a Cisco shop. We run Cisco for uh, the APs. We run Cisco Prime. We have some sites on Cisco DNA. And still, we found the, the views that we got from Mobile High were uh, extremely useful to us um, in, in our environment. You know, our environment is um, we run 
we're manufacturing. So we have uh, uh, facilities that are, you know, stacking up eight ton rolls of paper, um, you know, from floor to ceiling. It might be an empty warehouse one day. You know, a week later you come back, it's it's floor to ceiling, which makes for Wi-Fi design, as you can imagine, uh, gets to be a, a challenge in those areas, trying to uh, uh, to get signal in areas that sometimes are full and sometimes are empty. And so um, it, that's where, um, you know, it, we're also dealing with issues with our, uh, they're trying to load the product on the plant floor. It was critical that these devices that are uh, on our vehicle mounted units uh, stay connected so we could have good inventory that we could make sure the customers got the right product. So, so it was critical to the, the business that they kept these um, online. And so that, that's our challenges that we ran into. And um, what we really found is that um, as we were looking through the other tools, they didn't give us uh, enough insight to the client side. And, and it's been really nice that we could put the mobile eye on the, um, the, the clients, get some ideas what we were seeing. You know, one of the things, obviously, the, hey, we keep disconnecting. Why are we disconnecting? What's wrong? And, you know, prior to this, it was very hard for us to say definitively, you know, yeah, you're not in a dead spot because we never knew when they might have put up a wall of paper uh, in front of us. It was really, you know, once we could get that data uh, in front of our teams, uh, especially some of the client support teams and go, listen, here, you had um, your you got a sticky client. It had three other options for AP and for some for uh, for solid connections, and you still wanted to, you know, stay on this minus eighty, you know, uh, connection. You know, it, it really gave them some information so that they could start um, uh, looking at the areas that they needed to. You know, uh, I frequently tell them, you know, in the car world. If you've got a flat tire, it doesn't matter if I look at the transmission for a third time, you still get a flat tire. Uh, and it, it re really was able to bring them uh, to the table and get uh, some things. Uh, so one, we saw some sticky clients. Uh, I'll tell you a few. It also helped some of our uh, issues of looking at um, other client issues, um, like in a physical uh Problem that the client had for one, um, you know, the first week that we put on mobile eye, and I'm trying to think, this was probably a couple of years ago now, um, maybe 18 months ago, that, that we started using it, and um, we had a site that was complaining about some devices that um, weren't that were just constantly having problems, but we'd look at them and look okay, and um, it was a rather it, it was nice to have the history that we were going through, and we could see that these clients seemed to be working fairly normal saw a number of APs, and then we could pinpoint a time where we'd look at it and go, oh, suddenly um, this client that looked pretty normal suddenly saw no other APs, would only see one AP at a time, and even then it was a horrible signal. You know, it was like Wi-Fi was dead, but it was on other, uh, but none of the other clients that were driving around the same area. Um, and since we we're able to pinpoint the time that it happened, it was, uh, it was nice to they noticed, hey, the, on a shift change, <laughs> they were noticing that this thing went. And what was pretty obvious was that somebody was unplugging the antenna on their client device and, you know, so that it wouldn't work. Um, now, in all honesty, that was a pretty rare occurrence. Uh, you know, it's not like we have uh, employees going around trying to sabotage things all the time. But it, it was kind of a funny instance that we were able to uh, uh, to use that and say, hey, you know, we, we can pretty easily tell that, that the client can't see any other Wi-Fi. You know, that, that's just not normal. So th that was good. Uh, we've actually used it more normally in that scenario is, you know, again, we're in the manufacturing environment. Um, we've got clients that have antennas. Um, and, you know, those things get, it's on a fork truck. It's, you know, there's times they're going to get damaged. Um, they're not perfect. Those connections go bad. And, you know, that's the kind of thing, you know, a lot of times we would get hit with those kind of tickets, hey, Wi-Fi is having a problem checking the network when it was an antenna on the on the client that was having an issue. When we have this, you know, what took a little while to troubleshoot and we would eventually get to there, uh, you know, this suddenly became a real quick thing. You know, we could just pull it up in the seven signal software and go, yeah, I can see you, you don't see any APs and none of your other um, uh, vehicles around you are uh, having that issue. You've got a physical problem with your device. So it really has cut down on some of our uh, troubleshooting times 
that we were looking at things and that, that we could often offer them some solutions um, quickly. So so that's that's how we've used it uh, a number of times and we've been happy with the results we've seen. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Todd. You know, you bring up something really important. You know, we kind of joke um, around here that trying to catch Wi-Fi problems in the act is like trying to catch a ghost with a fishing net. And when you bring up the ability to go back in time and see, well, what was going on with that client? What was going on in the air yesterday or last week? Um, that's that's really an awesome story. Um, you know, it, it's you know, otherwise we're really kind of chasing our tails sometimes with trying to reproduce. Well, gosh, you know, what did happen yesterday or or, or last week uh, in in the location where you were with your device at this moment? Uh, it's it's almost impossible otherwise. So that's that's really good stuff. Thank you for sharing. So, yeah, it, and that has been true for us because, to, to be honest, my my clients they don't have time to troubleshoot. I don't. These these guys are trying to load a truck as fast as they can. They do not have time to sit down for 20 minutes and go. Well, did you you know release and renew your IP address? You know they don't have. No, they're they're moving on. They're replacing. Them. They're getting on another vehicle and moving on. So that, that's been really nice that I can. It's pretty independent. I can do a lot of troubleshooting without getting the user involved. That's awesome. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So that's it. That's uh, for our speaker panel. Really appreciate you guys. Just really awesome stories. Um, just sharing your knowledge, sharing your experience has just been amazing. Thank you for that. We are going to uh, move to our question. So, Don, we are going to. I want to. I want to see if uh, we've got some uh, a couple more minutes to ask a question or two. Is do we have that, Don? Yeah, we do. Uh, we've probably got time for three questions if I'm estimating estimating them out properly. Okay, so let's see what we can do here. Uh, one of the questions and. And uh, I'm not sure how much Meraki experience our audience or our um, our panelists have, but the question is regarding Meraki. But I think um, you know maybe because of the Cisco experience, it can it can bleed on over into Cisco as well. But but one question came through with regards to what are the additional features uh, from a monitoring perspective that we get with Sapphire Eye that we don't get from Cisco or Meraki. Um, maybe, um, you know, maybe, maybe uh, Nick or Tony, one of you gentlemen can kind of uh, maybe answer that because you have a lot of experience with the Sapphire and Cisco. Uh, Nick, how about you first? Yeah, sure. So um, the Cisco tools can give you a lot of information from the AP's point of view. You know, um, one thing, a good thing I can say about Cisco is their, the hardware and their APs are, you know, it's top notch really sensitive, you know, well-tuned radios and antennas, and, and they can, you know, give their two cents on the uh, wireless environment and provide really quality info. But, it, you know, it's two-way communication, right? The clients are also talking back, and, you know, every frame has to be acknowledged. So what really matters is how the client hears the infrastructure. Um, so to be able to see the, get the client's point of view on the communication, that that's what you can't get um, from from Cisco. So the the little asterisk is I think I some of the iOS devices can provide a little metadata back on some iOS versions, but for the most part, most devices you can't you can't get the client's point of view with uh, the vendor tools. Okay. Yeah. Tony, do you have anything that you'd like to add to that? I I would. Um, uh, so. Just making the transition from uh, Cisco to Aruba. So I get to experience uh, the set of tools from both perspectives. And right right now, um, I can make the direct comparison with a Cape sensor uh, versus a uh, Sapphire Eye. And so what you see um, from a Cape sensor is very, I, and I would say a high level myself, um, because I just I look at stuff a little more granular than that presents. Um, but it, it, it's a good level one, level two troubleshooting tool that the NOC would use, or maybe a user we would give access to go in and look at the airwave or a CAPE sensor. But you're not getting that background mechanisms that you see with both uh, a Sapphire Eye and a Mobileye together. 
and, and I say this, and I, when I say this, I really mean it. When you have both of those devices or both pieces working together, it really becomes child's play to see what's wrong in those transactions. I mean, it, 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 it is, to make it kind of simple, it, it goes from like, well, we, the, the wireless is bad to, oh, here's exactly what's going on and here's how we can either fix it or make, you know, make adjustments to make it work a little better. And it's just um, the granularity that I see from Sapphire, like this morning, when I showed that that uh, that capture I got, and that's kind of why I did that. Is it's a, any other tool that I have in my possession? And again, guys, I'm a, I don't think I said in the beginning I'm the lead wireless optimization engineer for Kaiser, and and so it always ends up on my team or my plate when something's going bad. And without being able to to see a visual like that, to be able to present that to uh, not only not only say the knock um, here at Kaiser, but an AIO, uh, and I can present that and say, here you go, here's the difference that I see, or even the planning team or the engineering team here. They've been looking at the same issue for the past week, and I go in and deploy the tools, and within 20 minutes I go, oh, and put your finger on it, and and the, but I give feedback, and I think Nick was hit on it earlier. I've solved so many other issues besides wireless with Seven Signal that it they hate to see emails from me. I think the other teams go, ah, oh, it's Tony again. And and and, and again, it's I don't like to point fingers. I just like to fix stuff, and I like to present it like that. Uh, but again, you know, when you get into these large organizations, people take offense sometimes to. And I, again, I don't want to call it finger pointing, but they take it that way. And anyway, I just, I probably need to stop talking here, guys. But nonetheless, you, I do see um, so-called really good tools out there. that are so-called good tools, and they are. It's just that um, I don't think they're mature as the seven signal devices and software. I'll shut up. Now. I actually, I really enjoy listening to you speak, Tony. So, uh, you know, it's okay. <laughs> And um, uh, so, uh, Don, I think, uh, you know, let's let's kind of I, I don't want to intrude upon uh, an important part of the presentation with regards to product roadmap. So uh, I did want to go to our trivia question uh, at the beginning. We did talk about how we would ask a question to pay attention because it would be based upon what our speakers uh, were talking about today. And so I'm ready for that. Uh, what are the rules, Don? Can you go over those with us real quick with regards to you know having the speedy response? Are we using the question pane? Yeah, so the rules are very, very difficult here, Eric. So all you need to do is use the drop down pane for uh, questions. And we're gonna go with the first person to respond with the correct answer. Uh, so Eric and I will monitor uh, that pane right now. And uh, okay. go ahead and ask your question, Eric. Okay, uh, now. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> that's not fair. Don, I, you're wearing a very handsome golf shirt. Is this potentially uh, an item that is up for yeah. grabs? <clears throat> so should you win, uh, you have uh, not only an option to pick a polo uh, or a hat, um, but also the color of your polo and, of course, the size. So, so many options for you. It's just uh, oh my gosh. It's incredible. Wow. Yeah. I mean, list goes like on. Your, uh, your, uh, your uh, Seven Signals tailor. It was great. Yeah. All right. So, here we go. So, earlier in the presentation, we heard from one of our customers uh, that they had a very large increase in something since COVID-19. I believe it was Tony said they had an 800% increase in what? All right, they're uh. coming in fast and furious. You know, they're all coming in in the same minute, Don. You may have to break it down either into milliseconds or just give everybody a shirt. What if we do, I'm willing to do the top three, Eric. Okay. So I've got uh, Casey, Ryan, and Blake all answered within milliseconds of one another with uh, telehealth. That's right, that's right. And I'll tell you, man, video is, is taken off like never before, not just in healthcare, my goodness, but uh, you know, all over the place with, with travel kind of you know, being curbed the way it is. 
Um, and as we all know, you know, you know, just like how I'm talking to you right now, it's voice over Wi-Fi, it's much more sensitive. Um, and then when you're dealing um, with different environments, different RF environments, um, you know, it can, it can be troublesome pretty quickly. So, uh, you know, obviously having a, a Wi-Fi performance management system in place, like our speakers have talked about, can be quite helpful in not only identifying Wi-Fi issues, but also I was just really pleasantly surprised, uh, Don and Jim, to hear about all of the other network issues that are being discovered using our system. You know what I mean, Jim? Yeah, and it really brings it back to Lee's point about the reputation of the Wi-Fi. If your right. DHCP infrastructure stinks, what do your end users say? You're, it's a Wi-Fi problem, right? They have a question mark on their or an exclamation point on their Wi-Fi icon, and they know it's a Wi-Fi problem. So it really is valuable to have that extra level of visibility. And to Tony's point, if there's a problem and you can help out, help out and get it fixed, even if it's, you know, the the territory of a different silo. So, well said. Up there. All right, Don, I'm going to pass it on over to you. All right, and I'm going to pass it on over to Simon. Uh, for those of you who have not met Simon yet, uh, he is our new VP of product. He's going to introduce himself in, in just a moment. Um, so go easy on him. He's only been here uh, five weeks. So uh, no tough questions for Simon today. <laughs> Simon, the, the floor is yours. Thanks, Tom. You got my slides up there? I do. I've got your introduction slide. Excellent. So uh, hi, everyone. And uh, it's nice to meet you all. I have uh, spoken to quite a few of you over the last five weeks. Um, and I look forward to uh, spending time getting to, to know more of our customers over the coming months. Um, just a little bit of background about me. Uh, I'll try to speak slowly. Uh, I am an Aussie originally. And uh, so uh, now living in America, um, blended family. And uh, so we spent a couple of years in California, but now living just outside of Nashville uh, in Franklin, Tennessee, uh, and loving it here. Um, my, ba my background, um, I've moved back and forth between product management and, and account management sales uh, for most of my career. Uh, I uh, have also moved you know, from a telecommunications environment uh, and the B2B SaaS environments and back, uh, and back again a couple of times. Um, I bring a pretty strong customer focus uh, as a result of my sales background, um, but I also have a broad background in all things uh, um, enterprise communications um, from IP telephony and, and voice uh, to MPLS networking. Um, probably most relevantly, uh, spent a lot of time doing remote access solutions and teleworking, uh, which is obviously pretty relevant at the moment, um, and a big amount of time, about 10 years, in the public Wi-Fi roaming and mobile offload space, which uh, obviously gives me some domain insight. So that is... Uh, Bit about me. Hope to hear about some of you uh, as we as we catch up. Um, did that and change slides. So just a bit about my philosophy from a product perspective. Um, really, I'm about building a strong foundation through ease of use. Um, one of the you know the guiding things is to um, you know not have uh, a need to have a lot of product specific knowledge. Uh, I think in the in the Wi-Fi space, there's enough um, domain expertise required um, to uh, to get to the root of a problem without having to have a lot of you know uh, seven sigma product specific knowledge. So, building a strong foundation um, with intuitive interfaces, um, user journey design is a core plank um, and kind of the framework with which I, I approach things. Um, what I mean by that is really thinking about and, and exploring the uh, its behavioral approach. Uh, so looking at how users engage with the product, what triggers that engagement and following the behaviors through to the resolution uh, of the of, of, or the goal that the user had in that engagement and building the workflows um, and the interfaces to support the user activity. Um, obviously, you know, we're an agile environment. We're looking to deliver some uh, big rocks uh, in, in our feature platform, but also to continuously add value We'll see that in the roadmap as well with some smaller smaller things that we add as we go. Um, and, uh, you know, 
thanks to Tony for, for uh, segueing into the last thing, which is that um, you know, wireless uh, networks are obviously becoming increasingly critical. Everything's connected to wireless networks these days, um, but we're, we, we're not operating in a bubble either. And so the ecosystem and the way that we integrate um, and provide um, insights for IT operations and digital experience management is that next step um, for the product as well. Um, and something that we have a focus on. So a little bit more practical, and I know that I, I don't have a lot of time here. Um, going to keep this reasonably high level, given that I haven't, uh, you know, uh, had a huge amount of, of time to to start to um, look at the prioritization here. Just breaking this down the way I'll normally do this. If you've, um, well, uh, it, it's a Russ normally does a, this uh, roadmap slightly differently if you've seen seven signal roadmaps before, but I like to break things into things that we're doing now. So this is things that would be, in, that are in progress that would be probably in the next release, um, perhaps the release after that, um, depending on how big the feature is. Um, in plan being the next things that we'll be tackling um, that are basically committed to um, and the planning horizon, which is generally you know, the things that we, we believe we'll be doing in the next six months. Um, so from a Sapphire feature perspective, I'm using Sapphire first because I know that um, since we um, changed our interface, uh, there hasn't been a lot of visible updates in Sapphire, although there's a lot of work going on in the background. Um, right now, uh, we're looking at in August having availability of location into Analyzer. So this is something that's been in the IQ uh, dashboard um, to date. Um, but it's a key feature to bring into Analyzer to improve um, usability and navigation. Uh, we're also making some significant changes to the topology navigation and the quick select functions, um, which uh, I expect will you know, make the uh, take away some of the, the, the pain of just getting to what you want to see uh, within the Sapphire platform. Um, we also have uh, over the air mode coming um, to the Sapphire products so that um, they will not necessarily require a wide connection in order to be able to operate and give you insights, which should give you a little bit more flexibility in deployment. Uh, in plan, um, some big work going on, uh, you know, uh, under the hood here um, for delivery. Um, jump in anytime you want to keep me honest, mate. Um, so in plan, um, we're looking at um, consolidating macro level KPIs, um, in particular organizing those in a way that's more familiar from a networking perspective by OSI layer. Um, we are, and I know there's been a rumor that IQ is going away. Well, that's not quite technically true. We, we want to bring the dashboard view into Analyzer and make it accessible within the single interface. Um, that uh, is definitely in play in the near future um, and um, will be, you know, that will also allow us to then drill down from those high level dashboard views into the macro KPIs and, and the underlying um, you know, causes. Um, we are also working on identification of the uh, KPIs for AX Wave 1, um, both on 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Um, a little bit further down the track, uh, AX 6 gigahertz, the Wave 2 uh, KPIs. Um, looking at integration with our mobile uh, IQ dashboard as well, um, and the ability to be able to drill from Analyzer into, into mo relevant mobile KPIs. Um, definitely looking at um, reducing, uh, improving our alarms and reducing false alarm noise, um, and um, plug and play eyes for easier deployment. Russ, anything you want to add to that list? No, you're doing great, new guy. Thank you. Um, so moving on to our mobile feature roadmap. Um, so also love hearing from both Tony and Nick. Uh, I, I think Tony was using the Sapphire interface when he was talking about chat, uh, channel interference. Um, and Nick um, showed an example of the client capability. So these are features that have been re relatively recently deployed or enhanced uh, within the mobile um, product. Um, up Upcoming is error rate with trending. Um, this is particularly important for giving an order of magnitude. I think um, you know today we we just give raw numbers of of problem of, pro of problem counts. Um, 
without necessarily having the context of, of, of uh, you know, what proportion of, of, of devices are experiencing the issue. So error rates is, is certainly critical and, a, and an underpinning for um, being able to enable us to deliver proactive um, alarms. We also have been working on uh, some of the install for Android, um, so ability to deploy through MDM and uh, uh, some support for the, uh, well, support for um, work around to uh, ensure that we, we still get regular data on Android 9 Plus devices uh, since the introduction of Doze mode um, for consistency. Uh, and um, those are both in plan, uh, sorry, in progress. Um, in plan, um, yes, Russ. Hey, let me hop in a little bit there, just on the Android 9 support. On the surface, it may sound, you know, kind of non-functional because it's really all about, um, as I think many of you know, uh, Android's been kind of going the way of iOS in terms of, kind of locking down access to Wi-Fi, restricting um, the ability for applications running in the background to um, to uh, get resources to do work. So, you know, as, as Simon's called out, right, where we'll be, we've tested and are, are seeing that even on um, Android 10, our, um, our, uh, our uh, tests are running on schedule as needed. And, but the exciting thing, as many of you have told us that um, you don't like the idea of always having to have a user interface on the Android application um, because it just gets in the way. So what we're doing is we'll, as a part of this, we're going to split out the user interface so that um, you no longer would have to have a user interface for the application kind of hidden or slide it off to the side. Uh, so, so good news, that's a customer request from way back and I'm glad we have the opportunity to deliver it along with this uh, Doze, uh, this Doze thing. Thanks, Russ. I didn't know all of that. It just, uh, my brain's a bit full at the moment. <laughs> um, so, uh, in terms of the, the, the near term plan, um, you know, alarms definitely on the roadmap. We're looking at, um, at MOS for Windows, which is uh, a pretty popular uh, feature request at the moment um, to be able to look at our voice performance, particularly at support um, you know, teleworkers and, and home based workers um, using a lot of. Uh, a lot of teleconference um, and video applications. Um, we also uh, intend to deploy, uh, to, to bring out a Linux agent, um, which is going to support particularly a lot of more specialized devices in the IoT uh, space. And um, that would, will broaden our, our ability to um, particularly support mission critical devices uh, in a lot of areas. Um, Looking out a bit further, um, you know, we're looking at uh, Russ. Russ mentioned splitting out the UI for them uh, for Android. Um, we we also want to be able to have an optional UI for all of our mobile agents that allows um, some of the critical data to be presented um, more locally, um, which uh, would support certain uh, support use cases um, and. Uh, um, the direct data ingestion for customers and partners could be is an interesting area as well. Um, the off-the-shelf hardware integration for packet capture and network service testing is more of that expansion into um, into the uh, uh, into more of the op IT operations space and being able to support more detailed end-to-end -end testing. Um, anything to add, Russ? Okay, so no, you're doing great, man. You're doing great. Great. So I think I'm. Um, Probably running up on time, but um, you know that's um, that's about as detailed as I get after five weeks. Um, but what I am really interested in is um, what our customers want to see. And so, um, Don, if you don't mind throwing up the survey question, I think this is an open an open answer response. Um, so go for your lives. Um, I'm just interested to see from our audience what feature or what doesn't have to be a feature necessarily, but what, what would you like to see most on the product roadmap from 7Signal? Yeah, thanks, Simon. And this survey question will come out uh, shortly from GoToWebinar. So please take advantage and um, you know, let us know how we can improve our product roadmap. If, uh, if you don't give us the feedback, it doesn't get added. So this survey is, uh, is a really important piece to, to the puzzle for us. Thank you uh, very much, Simon. Good job. Thanks, Tom.
So now we're doing a little something different here. And uh, Russ uh, Wangler, our CTO, popped on. You'll see him uh, down in the – well, for me, it's the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, he's coming to us live from Lake Ann, Michigan, if I'm not mistaken. Right, Russ? <laughs> that is correct. So and I am, I'm going to I'm gonna try and bring a little vacation to you all. Uh, yeah, right on. We could all use it. Um, so we did this internally. We did a, uh, we have a regular um, internal uh, webinars since everyone's working remote now. And Russ did this name that tune for us. Uh, it was an idea of uh, Tom Barrett's, our CEOs originally. So we thought we'd bring that to you all now. So we're going to use the question uh, pane. And uh, for each of you who, um, or sorry, for the first one that names that tune correctly, uh, you're going to get some Seven Signal swag. So uh, we've got a lot of different songs on our playlist. Um, so we're going to we're going to try and end this thing at one o'clock on the nose. Um, but as long as uh, you guys are feeling it and you want to stay on with us, you know we can go through some more of this playlist and and I can give out some more Seven Signal swag. So um, with that said, you know Russ, I'll turn it over to you and uh, get ready to start typing in some titles of songs. So t do they need just the title of the song, Russ, or do they need the title and the uh, com and the band? So you can go either way. One or two of these is a little bit more uh, outside. So if you could get the band, that would be enough. So if you know the title, that's the way to win. If you only know the band, put that in there, and we'll leave it up to Tom to decide who gets the swag. All right, sounds good. All right, I hope all you're right. all ready at home. All right, so last time we did this, um, there were some requests for more recent music so i learned a couple of new tunes we'll see how that goes so see how we get uh see if anybody gets this one this is uh definitely from the 90s <laughs> Today is gonna be the day that they're gonna throw it back to you. By now, you should have somehow realized what you gotta do. I don't believe that anybody feels the way I do about you now. Surprisingly, it's gotten us young. Yeah, we, we got it. Oh, we got it. Yeah, Q&A. I know you should have done before, but you never really had a doubt. Well, I don't believe it's anybody feels the way I do about you now. Get it, Tom? Yeah. Yeah. We're feeling it. Yeah. So, yeah. So, a, a number of you uh, know this song, Oasis, uh, Wonderwall by Oasis. Uh, but our first one, Olivier, who comes to uh, most of our uh, best practices webinar, was the first one. Um, so congrats uh, for that. You know, he did say Taylor Swift first, though. He Does did. that disqualify him? <laughs> well, he, yeah, so we should disqualify him for, for saying Taylor Swift at all. But uh, that was as a joke before Russ even started playing. <laughs> <laughs> So hey, just so it'll help me to know where where should I see the responses? Should I look in chat? Uh, Q and A. Yeah. Look in the Q and A. Look in the Q and A. So is that yeah. in chat or in questions? Uh, it's a separate questions. area. Yeah, questions. Question. Ah, Wonderwall for sure. All right, that I was. I'm trying to follow so that you know. Uh, all right, very good. Okay, very good. So let's see. This is going to be so easy. So I if I'll be I'll be amazed if people don't get this within like a bar. <laughs> So uh, Mike, oh, look w, at all you. Yeah. <laughs> Mike W was the first to respond. I won't say his last name, but there was a couple other mics that uh, responded correctly as well. Sweet Home Alabama nailed it. And, you know, before we go on, Russ, I think, we, we you know. Get a, we did get a Kid Rock answer. <laughs> <laughs> we got Sweet Carolina also. <laughs> Carolina, Carolina on my mind, also a good song. 
<laughs> yeah, strange. This, this, the, the way the chat works is odd because I can't really see it. All right, well, let's move on. I, let's see, this is a lot newer. So this, you have to have a little bit more, uh, more recent ear to get this one. Do you have the time to listen to me whine about nothing and everything all at once? I am one of those melodramatic fools, neurotic to the bone, no doubt about it. Sometimes I give myself the creeps. Sometimes my mind plays tricks on me. It all keeps adding up. I think I'm fucking up. Am I just paranoid or am I just stoned? I'm assuming lots of people got that. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, we got uh, a number of c correct answers, but uh, Ryan C was the first to say a basket case. Um, so a uh, well done. And, you know, this reminds me, Russ, with, uh, you know, for our competitors that are on the line, this is a this is a reminder that our CTO is much cooler than yours. So thanks for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now this is this is for the, those of you. I, I remember some, I think one of the customers said that they had a grandchild. I bet you for the, the, those who are a little bit older, this is probably more likely for you to get. Oh man, look at my life. I am a lot like you were. Oh man, look at my life. 24 and there's so much more. Live alone in a paradise that makes me think of two. Love lost such a cause. Give me things that don't get lost. Like a coin that won't get tossed. Rolling home to you. Anybody get it yet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot. Yeah, a lot, a lot of fun. Oh, man, take a look at my life. I'm not like you. I think the lyrics give this one away. You summer to love me the whole day through. Oh, I love that song so much. All right, that, that was hat. good. Yeah, right, so let's, uh, let's move on to something new. Uh, this is new for me, too. I learned it yesterday. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, and the uh, the winner of that one was, uh, well, there's a couple of Davids that answered correctly and a couple of David Fs. So I'm going to say David F-O-R uh, was the winner of that one. All right, here we go. Another turning point, a fork sticking in the road. Time grabs you by the wrist, directs you where to go. So make the best of this test and don't ask why. It's not a question, but a lesson learned in time. It's something unpredictable, but in the end it's right. I hope you have the time of your life. I'm guessing that was easy for many yeah. people. You got a you yeah. got an offer to play at a customer's uh, golf outing, Russ. Uh, <laughs> I won't say the company, but they're huge. <laughs> well, I do like, uh, if if we, if we were on, if this weren't virtual, I would say sorry. Just throw money. Hand <laughs> <laughs> out your uh, Venmo, and and people can throw you tips. That's right. All right, so here we go. So, so here's so the, I'm going to uh, give coming back. Go ahead. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this to two winners. Uh, Time of Your Life is not the actual official name of the song, but Richard L. Uh, was the first to say Time of Your Life. The actual song is Good Riddance. And uh, Andrew R. was the first uh, correct answer there. So I'm going to, you're both getting seven signal swag, but uh, Andrew, you were technically correct. All right, so here we go. So this is, this is coming back to the 90s. Doesn't need any words. I wish I could watch the question and answer because it's going to come back so fast. Um, uh, uh. 
Oh yeah, instantly. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think that was long. <laughs> uh, 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 Mark Mick will say uh, was the first one with the correct answer. Excellent. All right, so here's going. We'll go back in time a little bit again. Um, see, uh, see how this goes. I haven't done this in years. We had broken up for good just an hour before. Uh, 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 uh. And now I'm staring at the bodies as they're dancing across the floor. Uh, 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 uh. And the band slowed down the tempo. Yeah, and the music. <laughs> I bet you somebody got it. <laughs> I don't know this one. Yeah, you don't know so that one? No. I didn't Is know it? this one either. I had to look at the play tunes list, so I cheated. <laughs> Did anybody uh, get it? Yeah, Ryan Ryan C got it. So he's a, a two time winner. He knows his tunes. Mm. All right. Okay. So uh, all right. So I screwed that one up, but maybe give him double for my mistake. All right. Yeah, so let's see. Off. All right. So this is this one's more fun for me. We'll see how long this one takes. <laughs> took a little longer and I'm debating whether or not that's cheating by waiting for the lyrics in the song title. Uh, I thought I was going to I thought I was going to save some money on this one. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, we'll give this one uh, to David F. Uh, Pride and Joy nailed it. Uh, Steve, you're right. All right. All right. So my, my wife explained to me that we're on vacation and she doesn't want me carrying this on too long because I'm supposed to be drinking beer on the boat. So I've got two two songs left. The first one is dedicated to Simon, and we'll see. Uh, I'm not, there's no words. We'll see how long this one takes. <laughs> was the first one there. <laughs> what do you think about that, Simon? That worked for you? Thanks for that, Russ. Appreciate it. <laughs> I got to love the Aussies, man. Got to love the Aussies. So, All right, so. So, Russ, with this hmm. last one, why don't you play us out? So, we'll we'll play it. I'll, um, I'll say when the winner comes in, and then we'll thank everybody for joining and just keep on playing. How about that? You bet. <laughs> Wait a minute. I have to do one thing, though. I said I was going to bring vacation, so right after this, I'm out to the boat, so I'm going to have a little drink. That's a soda. <laughs> of course it is. That's a soda pop. Of course it is, because I'm a soda kind of guy. Isn't that what everybody did with their DoorDash? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This when the rains came down in a hollow, playing a new game, laughing and running, yeah, skipping and jumping. Awesome. Missed him all in fog. So we got one. we got the last one in there. It's uh, John Foster. Russ, keep on playing. Uh, John, we're going to add you to the win list. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Great job by all the presenters. That was a lot of fun. Have a great week, everybody. And whatever happened, 
the two staying so slow. Come down the old man with a 